but extension is primarily because we hear quite a bit that we are well a well kept secret and that defeats the purpose. We don't want to be a well kept secret. We want everyone to know about the resources we have to offer. Let me find my mouse. Sometimes my mouse acts up. Okay, so what is extension? Extension is a partnership between Sarasota County, the University of Florida, and the USDA. So we get funding from three sources. And what we do is we use university research and resources to address local needs through community initiatives, classes, outreach, and volunteer opportunities. And extension provides practical education to help residents, professionals, and decision makers build a better future. So this is a map of all the land grant universities and colleges that Extension is a part of. Now, I always like to include this map because it just shows that even though you're benefiting from Extension here, we are a nationwide network of Extension agencies that are tied to land grant colleges. So if you lived in other states, you can look at this map and find what the land grant college is. In New York, it's Cornell. And in, let me see, let me just pick a state. In Colorado, it's Colorado State University. So in Sarasota County, the Extension Office offers programming in all of these areas. Today we're talking about HOA landscapes, but we also do programming in natural resources. So we do natural, Master Naturalists, we have the Master Gardener program. Some of you joining us today may be Master Gardeners. We have educational programs on how to take care of our water resources. And so that would include your Florida Water Stewardship Program, your Lake Watch Program, your Sea Grant Program, and your Florida Microplastic Awareness Program. We also have educational programs on sustainability and increasing um, you know, our sustainable use of resources. And so that would include our energy upgrade that gives, um, this gives education on energy efficiency and distributes energy efficiency kits. And there are sustainable communities, green business partnerships, which partner with businesses to help them to use more sustainable packaging. We also have 4-H youth programming and we do family nutrition and family and consumer science programming that help you to maintain a healthier lifestyle avoid um, chronic issues like diabetes and, um, you know, take care of your heart and, and um, healthy living. So we offer quite a range of programs in our extension office. And that's one of the reasons why we don't like to hear that we're a best kept secret. <laughs> okay, so let's dive in. HOA landscapes, troubleshooting solutions, we're gonna cover these topics. We're going to look at are your landscape plants healthy? We're going to look at what are the most common issues in HOA landscapes. We're going to look at what types of landscape best management practices can be used to prevent landscape problems. So when we're looking at troubleshooting landscape solutions, we're looking at the following goals. We want to improve plant health, we want to improve aesthetic value, and we want to improve cost efficient landscape management. Some of the factors contributing to cost efficient, I have to bring over my tongue, I need more coffee. Cost efficient landscape management include using Florida friendly landscape plants and applying Florida friendly landscape principles. And we will briefly recap what those are as we go forward, but we, we wanna look at, are you putting the right plant in the right place? Are you, giving the right amount of irrigation, you're not over irrigating or under irrigating, or you're using mulch appropriately to cut down a number of weeds you get. Are you fertilizing appropriately? Sometimes when you fertilize at the wrong time of year, or you give it too much, you give plants too much fertilizer, then you can have issues. Nutrient recycling. So it is always good for you to compost your yard waste. You can put nutrients back into your soil. 
Are you controlling stormwater runoff? Are you protecting the waterfront? Are you providing for pollinators in terms of pollinator plants? And are you applying integrated pest management solutions? These factors will all tie in to cost efficient landscape management. So this guide, we have hard copies available at the extension office. You feel free to drop by anytime, Monday to Friday, 5 to 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. for a copy, it's free of charge, or you can get a PDF copy. This helps a lot to find you solutions when you're troubleshooting landscape problems, especially when you want to replace problem plants. So on the at the beginning of the book, there are some really, really cool um, guides that show you, for example, if you see my pointer here, and I'm going to try to zoom in, five common gardening mistakes. You want to pay attention to this page right here. Um, hope I'm not giving you motion sickness by zooming in. But you do want to pay attention to this because it does give you some answers to common landscape problems. So you want to look at, um, like I mentioned, you want to look at your irrigation um, practices. You don't want to overwater plants, but you also don't want to underwater. And so What's really good about this guide is that any plant you choose in the guide is going to have a legend and the legend will tell you whether the plant likes a lot of water or a little bit of water the plant needs to be kept drier on the drier side. Okay, So this um, page in the, the Florida Friendly Landscape Solution Guide is very helpful. Second mistake, it helps you to address it's over planting when you're designing your landscape. So typically when you put in landscape plants, they are smaller because you know they're brand new plants, but people tend to over plant. And so, you know, because they want that full look, they'll put as many plants in as possible, but these plants are gonna get larger and then you end up with plants overcrowding each other. And then you have disease issues because the plants aren't getting enough air circulation. And so you want to avoid over planting when you, you're just installing your landscape. So that's one mistake you want to avoid. You want to avoid over pruning your plants because when you prune your plants, you're actually removing the photosynthetic tissue. This is a tissue that the plant relies on to make food. And so when you remove the plant's food source, you are contributing to um, you know, a source of stress and that source of stress can make the plant more susceptible to pests and diseases. So that's another mistake you wanna avoid. You also want to avoid, as I mentioned before, either over fertilizing, under fertilizing or using the wrong type of fertilizer because this can actually create more problems than they solve. And so that's one one um, element you definitely want to consider when we're talking about addressing landscape problems. And then point number five, you want to use pesticides correctly. So you want to avoid using pesticides incorrectly and getting rid of all insects because there are some insects that are beneficial. They actually eat the insects that are harming your plants. And so you want to be aware of integrated pest management strategies so you don't get rid of the beneficial insects in addition to getting rid of the harmful insects. All right. So another key feature of this, this guide that I told you to get, either download it from your phone, you know, there's a PDF version, you just click on the link and download it or get a hard copy is if you're having landscape challenges. The book walks you through solutions. So I'm just going to zoom in here. Maybe I zoomed all the way in. Yeah. 
So the picture on the left here, you will see, you know, landscapes not looking too attractive. So this is the before picture on the left and then the after picture on the right, the, the, the book takes you through how you can make the landscape more attractive using Florida friendly plants. Whoops. And I zoomed all the way out. So um, give me one second. Sometimes my mouse is just like super sensitive. Okay. Another before and after, you know, where you want to spruce up your landscape, make it look a little more attractive. And um, on the left, before picture, on the right, after picture. Same here, before picture on the left, you know, your turf is declining. You had maybe some pest or fungal issues and there are bald spots in your turf. And so this is how you can renovate it without, you know, replacing sod on numerous, on numerous occasions. And that's why it happens to some, you know, some property owners or managers, um, they struggle to keep sod alive for one reason or another, maybe it's sandy soil and the soil just dries out very quickly. And so one solution is replacing the turf with ground covers, as you'll see the picture on the right. Again, another solution, you know, before is um, the picture on the left and after is your picture on the right. And you have a fence line that's like totally not interesting. <laughs> Don't want, I didn't want to say boring, I was trying to be polite, but totally uninteresting fence line and you make it more attractive with these um, recommendations in the diagram on the right okay again if you have say large trees in the middle of turf um, and you want to reduce the maintenance around these large trees here are solutions where you don't have to mow as much because you've re removed some of the turf you might have um a utility box that you want to screen. So this is your before picture on the left and your after picture on the right. And then very important, we'll talk about this a, li a little later, but very important, you want to make sure that the nutrients that are getting into your pond, um, those levels are reduced as much as possible because when nutrients get into your pond, nutrients on the soil, or nutrients from your turf fertilizer, it affects the health of your pond in that it increases the growth of algae. And when algae um, bloom, you know, when the population increases, it depletes the oxygen in the water, and then you'll have fish kills. And then you'll have a backyard pond full of dead fish, and who wants that? So, again, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Plant Guide. There's an app you can get on your phone. You can download the hard copy version electronically, or you can pick up a physical copy at our office. All right. So remember when I said that the book has a legend, as you go through the book, you'll see that it includes solutions for turf, how high you need to mow your turf because if you mow your turf too late, I'm sorry, if you mow your, your turf too low, I told you I need more coffee, it will actually cause the turf to be more susceptible to drought stress, chinch bug pressures, and fungal issues. And so the screenshot I have here on the right tells you exactly how high you need to mow your turf. Okay. So depending on where you're, you live, the, the book zones plants according to North Florida, Central Florida, and you'll see the cutoff point there and the South Florida. So wherever you live, 
what you'll do is when you decide, you know, hey, I really like this plant, I want to put it in my yard, you will look at the legend to see if it's zoned for North, Central, or South Florida. And as I said, you know, I like to call this book our cheat sheet on steroids because it just takes the guesswork out of plant selection. So as I mentioned, it will tell you, does this plant need a little bit of water, medium water or a lot of water? Does this plant like full sun? You can see my pointer here, or shade. And so it takes a lot of guesswork out. And so on the side here, it is arranged in sections of large trees, medium trees, small trees. Similarly for shrubs, large shrubs, medium shrubs, small shrubs. Then you have your vines and your ground covers, etc. So it's a really neat book. Okay, so on the screenshot on the left here where you see my arrow, you'll see that I am showing you a page of medium trees. Small, um, small trees, etc. You get the idea. And as you go through, you can select, you know, the plant. Hey, I like this plant. I mean, look, is it zoned for my area? Will it need a lot of water? If it needs a lot of water and you don't have an in-ground um, irrigation system, you probably don't want to put that plant in because it means that you're going to have to water it by hand you know, with a hose um, to keep that plant happy. Okay, and as I mentioned, the book has is broke is broken down into different sections. You have your vines. You see my arrow here. You have your ground covers. So I would start when we're trying to troubleshoot solutions and we're thinking about replacing plants. I would definitely start with right plant, right place, and this book is a good resource for helping you to decide on the right plant for the right place. Okay, um, more sections include your grasses and your palms, okay, your ferns and your perennials, your annuals. All right, another really good site um, is floridayards.org where you can click on this link and say, hey, I live in Central Florida. I want to plant a tree. I'm going to plant a tree on the south facing side of my property. And once you click and put all that information in, it will help you to select a plant. Okay. So as I mentioned, here's an example, Central Florida. I want to plant a tree. I select a tree. Um, do I want native plants only? Do I want it to be in full sun? Do I want low soil moisture or high soil moisture? Is my soil sandy? Once you select all of these things, you click on find plant and the selector will, will help you. Sorry, my mouse is behaving really crazy. You know, having a crazy mouse day. All right, so as I mentioned, you click find plants and it will help you to find a list of plants. And once you click on find plants, it gives you a list of suggestions for Central Florida and your soil type that you put in. You want to avoid invasive plants. So these are problem plants. You put them in, you can't take them out. Um, and what I mean by that is you can try to take them out, but because they have aggressive root systems or they are, you know, they weedy, what I call weedy plants where you have lots of seeds and that kind of thing they're really difficult to remove. All right, so examples of those include your air potato, your, once it's there, it's like really impossible to get rid of. You also have your alamanda. And I know you will see alamanda um, planted, but 
the there is a, a group of um, researchers that researches the invasive potential for plants. And so even at this point, it's not pro, even though at this point it's not prohibited, it's considered a high invasive risk. Issues. My apologies. Okay, so Brazilian pepper, um, definitely on the invasive list. Mm -hmm. you do not want to plant it. Carrot wood as well on the invasive list. You don't want to plant it. Lantana, definitely on the invasive list. Don't want to plant that. Melaleuca is prohibitive. Prohibited, I should say. You can't plant it. Mexican petunia on the invasive list. Um, I know you'll find it being planted, but um, the researchers have determined that it is an, an invasive. You'll find it in areas that have not been cultivated. Moringa is considered a high invasive risk as well. Your pozos, yep, definitely invasive. Purple orchid tree is considered high invasive risk. There is one that's sterile, um, which is your Hong Kong orchid, but this particular species, the Bohemia purpurea, is, is on the invasive list. Rosary pea is prohibited. Schlefera, also called the umbrella tree, is invasive. Your snake plant is considered on the high invasive risk. So you don't want to put these plants in your landscape. Your syngonium is invasive. Your wedelia is invasive. And um, so none of those plants you want to put on your invasive, on in your landscape, I should say. Okay. All right. So we looked at Florida friendly landscape plants, and now we're going to look at the other factors contributing to a cost efficient landscape management. So we're gonna talk about right plant, right place. I know I mentioned that um, in a little bit, um, a, a few slides ago, but let's take a deeper dive into why you want to make sure that you have the right plant for the right place because it will solve a lot of problems going forward. Um, okay, so if you put the right plant in the right place, it will avoid you having to prune plants constantly. And I'll show you what I mean in a few slides. Um, the, if, if the plant is too large for the space you put it in, you're gonna always have to be pruning. So if the mature height of the plant is supposed to be 15 feet, but you want a plant that's only going to be three feet tall, then you have the wrong plant in the wrong place. And so what you wanna do is make sure to look at the mature height of the plant before you install it. What's the mature height gonna be? Um, and so you wanna make sure that if you put the right plant in the right place, you will not need to prune, you know, very often, okay? So save yourself time and money by having to prune plants all the time. But also when you plant, when you prune plants frequently, as I mentioned before, because you are removing photosynthetic tissue and you're also wounding the plant, what will happen is that the plants will get stressed out and when the plants get stressed out, you 
will make them more susceptible to fungal diseases. And then you're going to have to spend more money spraying the plants for fungi because you stress them out by over pruning. You're also pests that are attracted to stressed out plants like your palmetto weevils um, and other caterpillars like the bougainvillea caterpillar is attracted to bougainvillea that are constantly pruned because the bougainvillea are under stress. Um, and so what will happen is that you will make the problem for yourself worse by over pruning the plant, stressing it out, and then it becomes more attractive to pests and diseases. So that's one way you can um, address a landscape solution. Okay. So whenever you're pruning, you want to look for what your pruning objectives are. And it should be because you're trying to size a plant, um, remove the fruit, and you want to remove fruit, especially for palms. So if you're not planning to plant the seeds on a Christmas palm or the seeds of a queen palm or the seeds of a foxtail palm, or you're not planning to harvest the coconuts, you want to remove the fruit when they become the size of a grape because the plant um, puts energy into making the fruit mature and once you allow the fruit to go to maturity and then you remove them and toss them in the trash, you're actually causing the plant to expend energy and nutrients into maturing fruit that you're not going to use. And so prune the fruit off. Um, you should always have an objective when you're pruning. We talked about the fact that excessive pruning makes the plant more susceptible to pests and diseases. And so you can actually shorten the lifespan of your plant if you're always pruning it, which is why you want to make sure that you put the right plant in the right place. And when you're doing pruning cuts, we're not gonna go in depth into pruning in this session. We have another session um, on pruning. You can look on our, our class schedule and see when the next session and pruning is going to be. But just briefly to say that when you're pruning, you want to follow the plant's natural structure and growth form, because wherever you prune, the plant is going to be triggered to grow more tissue to replace the tissue you removed. And so you don't want new growth coming in, um, in at odd angles and, and um, you know, kind of defeating the purpose of your pruning to begin with. Okay, so when I said over pruning is a problem, here is a plant that's, at, um, you know, a high, in a tra high traffic area near a walkway. Obviously the plant was getting too big and blocking the walkway. And so they've constantly pruned this plant back to resize it but really it's the wrong plant in the wrong place. They should have you put in something that would not have gotten as large and, and block access to traffic, okay? When I mention pruning objective again, I'm not really sure what the pruning objective here is. It's, it's certainly not to resize a plant. I, I think it's oleanders, um, but you've removed every single bit of photosynthetic tissue from these plants. And so now you, what you've done is you've triggered them to start suckering because now th these plants are starving because there is no green tissue to make any food whatsoever. So they're starving um, and out of stress, they are sending up emergency suckers from the roots so that they can get some food to be produced. Okay. 
these are crepe myrtles. We see this a lot and we know that, you know, people tend to prune crepe myrtles like this so that the new growth is all the same age. And once the new growth is all the same age, it will flower at the same time. And you have this glorious display of flowers. So there is a method behind the madness. However, this kind of pruning does stress the plant out. And as I showed you in the slide before, it can trigger um, suckering. That's just the plant's response to stress. The plant is sending up green tissue because it has no food. There's nothing green on this plant. And the only way the plant accesses food is through green photosynthetic tissue. So here, um, the palm on the left is not properly pruned. You've removed a lot of the photosynthetic tissue in the canopy. I would say more than half of this palm canopy has been removed, which means that you're starving the palm of food because this is how the palm makes its food. Um, I always say to people, fertilizer is not plant food. You can't give plants food. They're not like pets where you give your, plant, your pets some food. Plants make their own food. You can give them nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium. Those are the elements that are in fertilizer and then they will use those elements to make their own food, but you can't give plants food. And so it is the pruning that's done on the right here where you see my pointer, that's acceptable pruning where you, know, you have a relatively um, a full canopy, 360 degrees. You don't want to prune anything above what we call the nine to three o'clock mark on a clock. You don't want to remove anything above the nine to three mark. So this palm on the left is definitely pruned inappropriately or over pruned. When you over prune palms, you stress them out because you're depriving them of food and you make them more attractive to palmetto weevils. You can also introduce diseases when you over prune palms because you're removing the green fronds. When you remove the green fronds, um, the plant is, is wounded and it has to seal the wound. And the fact that it has to seal that wound makes it open to, um, contracting a disease. So when you're pruning, you only want to remove brown fronds. Wait until the fronds are completely brown and then you remove them. Okay. So in the chat box, I want you to type your answers to this poll question. And the question is, true or false, pruning can contribute to plant pests and diseases. So type that in your chat box. I'll give you about maybe 30 seconds to tie the answer in while I look at questions you might have had. So the answer to that is true. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna keep looking at the chat box and um, see if you have any more questions and then we'll continue. Okay, so let's go on to the next factor in addressing landscape troubleshooting. So water is a good thing for plants and animals, but too much water is not a good thing, okay? When the plants are overwatered, you can get nutrient leaching, which means all the nutrients that are in the soil have now run out below the root zone. And that's what we call leaching, which is a vertical movement of nutrients through the soil. And let me just pause right here. You might know what leaching is and 
you know, the fact that I'm going over um definition, you might think, why am I going over the definition of leaching? But in extension, we always teach in the middle of the audience, knowing that there are some members of the audience who know a lot about the subject and some members in the audience who know a little bit about the subject. And so we always try to not assume that everybody knows a lot or everybody knows a little. So we'll go over definitions of some terms that people may know, but then again, people may not know. So that's just a sidebar. Okay. So if you put down water in excess of what the plant requires, you're not only wasting water. And yes, even if you're on a well and think you can't waste well water, yes, you can because when water is taken up from the well faster than the well can recharge it, what we call the recharge rate, it can result in what they call salt water intrusion, where the salinity of your irrigation water increases because um, the, the period of accessing water from the well is not sufficient enough to allow the well to recharge. So yes, well water can be wasted. Anyway, another sidebar. So if you put down water in excess of what the plants need, the nutrients get leached out and so you'll have nutrient deficient plants so you have just created a problem for yourself you also make the soil waterlogged and waterlogged soils are very attractive to fungal and bacterial diseases which means that your disease management costs have just increased and so you've just created another problem for yourself by Overwatering, and when we say overwatering, I know it's kind of hard to conceptualize what does that mean. But overwatering just means you're putting on more water than the plant needs, and so it will vary. Um, I can tell you, plants don't need to be watered every day. I don't. I've never met a plant that needs to be watered every day. Not even plants that like a lot of water, um, like your impatience. You know depending on how much water you give an impatience, every other day might be good enough. Okay, so is your irrigation helping or hurting? Unless you were talking about turf or annuals, annuals tend to require more water than perennials. And because you're constantly mowing turf, it requires water to replace all the, the grass tissue you've removed, okay? So with the exception of turf and annuals, most landscape plants will not require frequent irrigation once, you're, once it's established. So your ferns, your hibiscus, your bougainvillea, no need to irrigate these plants. Once you put them in and they're established, you don't need to irrigate them unless there is um, a particularly long dry period and the plants will tell you, hey, I've had water in a long time, I need it, you know, you'll see them drooping, etc. But when you have your sprinkler system and it's watering your exora and your hibiscus and your bougainvillea every day, you are setting yourself up for landscape problems. You also want to make sure that you group your landscape plants according to their water requirements. And so you wouldn't want you wouldn't put something with a low water requirement next to a plant with a high water requirement because to keep the high water requirement plant happy you'd have to overwater the low one and to keep the low water requirement one happy you would underwater the high one and so you want to make sure that you're grouping your plants together in plant beds that have the same watering needs so you don't cause a problem for yourself. Okay, so your irrigation schedules will be based on your water restrictions wherever you are, the days of the week. There are some places where, you know, odd number addresses can only water on one day and even numbers water on the other. And these, are, these restrictions are in place because water is not an infinite source. Like I said, you can cause salt water intrusion in your well um, you can get to a point where, you know, 
there is a drought and water our water sources are not being replenished as quickly as we are drawing from them and so you want to be cognizant that you're not wasting water and if you are applying water in amounts that are greater than the plants need then you are wasting water all right so you want to make sure that your irrigation schedule is based on your water restrictions your irrigation schedule is also based on rainfall so in summer where we get rain almost every single day your irrigation system shouldn't be going off at all you know um and your irrigation system if it's an automatic system it should be equipped with a rain shutoff device which basically tells the irrigation system not to go on if rain has fallen in the last 24 hours. And as I mentioned before, depending on your irrigation source, whether it's um, reclaimed water, potable water, or well water, if you're taking water from the system in, in amounts greater than it's able to recharge in a certain period, then you can um, contribute to water shortages. Okay, so when you're irrigating, you want to avoid irrigating when evaporation rates are high, which is in the middle of the day when it's breezy, because it means that whatever water you put out, the plants aren't going to benefit from it, because evaporation is going to take most of your water. As I mentioned in this, um, like a few seconds ago, you want to make sure that your irrigation system has a functioning rain sensor. So um, if your in irrigation system was installed 10 years ago and you're like, yes, I'm sure we have a rain shutoff device, you need to check it and make sure it's working. Um, it's it's supposed to be it's supposed to be damp because in cork based systems, the cork absorbs water whenever it rains. Um, and the irrigation shutoff device should be in a place where it has access to rainfall. So if it rained yesterday, then the cork in your shutoff device would be wet and it would make sure that the device does not go on. Um, you can also have a rain shutoff device called a soil moisture sensor, but that's another presentation. Um, and that will help you to make sure that your irrigation system is going off and when the moisture is needed and not during rainfall or after, the day after it rains. When you're repairing or designing your irrigation system, you wanna make sure that you're not having a combination of sprinkler heads because that can cause underwatering or overwatering. And then you want to make sure that you calibrate your irrigation system so that you know that you're not putting out more water than the plant needs or less water than the plant needs. We offer a free irrigation calibration site visits. They, at this point, you can um, be added to our wait list. And that's a link that directs you to the wait list. And I can put it in the chat at the end. You also want to make sure, like for your annuals, you do a low floor, low flow irrigation system to help to conserve water. All right. So poll question number two, which I always like to throw polls in just to mix it up a bit. Um, so you know it's not just a talking head <laughs> um, coming at you. So right now in the chat. Type in the answers to this question, and I'm going to look, see if there are any other questions in the chat box. So true or false, irrigation can contribute to plant nutrient deficiencies. I'm going to give you a few seconds to answer that.
And the answer to that is true. Okay. So next, let's look at another um, landscape solution, your mulch. Um, mulching provides benefits to plants, and this is not just us thinking it's a great idea. We actually do have researchers that watch plants grow for a living. I tease them all the time. <laughs> but the fact that they get paid to watch plants grow. Um, but the research shows that mulch will reduce competition from weeds for water and nutrients. So mulch is your friend and mulch also increases soil moisture retention. And so you have to irrigate less often or in lower volumes. And so mulching is your friend and that's one <laughs> solution that you can um, use to address landscape problems. So when, you, when you're when you applying mulch, we recommend that you use sustainably harvest, sustainably harvested mulches. So for example, there was a time when cypress mulch was sold, but nobody could verify whether or not, you know, the companies were just driving into the swamp and cutting down cypress trees which is not a sustainable source of cypress. You going into the swamp and cutting on cypress trees is destroying the habitat for a lot of our wildlife. And so you wanna make sure that the mulch you buy is sustainably sourced. It's not you know, a company that's just going down and destroying habitat to sell mulch. When you apply mulch, it should not be applied at a thickness that's greater than three inches. Um, and that's the ideal depth of mulch application that the researchers have um, determined. When you put your mulch down, it should not come into direct contact with us, with the plant stem or the trunk. Because remember, we said that mulch holds soil moisture. And so when you have moisture right up against the stem or the trunk, you will encourage um, a stem rot, and um, that will kill your plant. Various types of mulch, um, there are pros and cons to each, so there's no one mulch that you can say, yes, this is the perfect mulch. There are pros and cons. Um, you could use rock and stone mulches, but you don't want to use them around what we call acid-loving plants, like your exors and gardenias, because when once this rock or stone mulch goes through a weathering process, rain and sun, et cetera, it um, raises the pH of the soil and your acid loving plants will not thrive. So the next tip on our list of Florida friendly landscaping principles that will help you to have a more cost efficient landscape is nutrient recycling. So you wanna leave behind your grass clippings because your grass clippings has nutrients in it, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Um, and this will avoid you having to use as much fertilizer. You want to take your leaf litter and you wanna incorporate your leaf litter in your compost pile um, because your leaf litter also has nutrients in it and you wanna um, be able to take advantage of recycling nutrients. Okay, when you're fertilizing, as I mentioned, fertilizer is not plant food. Plants make their own food. So, you know, you will see different labels in the, in the garden center plant food, but there's no such thing. You can't buy that on a shelf. <laughs> Plants make it. You can buy nitrogen, you can buy phosphorus, you can buy potassium, and that's what plants use to make their own food. Um, so when you're buying fertilizer, what you're buying is nutrients and you should only apply fertilizer if the plants are showing that they have a sign of a nutrient deficiency. 
so you know i have had questions about you know how much fertilizer do we need to give our shrubs and you know the answer to that is none <laughs> um unless your shrub is a gardenia an azalea an exora because we have high pH soils they tend to become iron deficient, sometimes potassium deficient. You want to give your those shrubs, just those shrubs, some fertilizer. But your bougainvillea, nothing hibiscus, nothing unless you're growing your hibiscus to enter into, you know, the hibiscus society's um, plant show, and you need to have a bloom that's twice the size of your palm. <laughs> or twice the size of your hand, then shrubs don't need supplemental fertilizers. Your lawn, however, because you're constantly cutting it in May, it, it's, not, it's not a must, but it may need some supplemental nutrients. And so um, that's the recommendation um, to apply fertilizers to your lawn and your palms. Your palms we may show um, some nutrient deficiencies because palms flower a lot and they produce fruit. And so they tend to have high, nit high nutrient requirements, I should say. So your palms may need to be fertilized. So that's what we mean when we say fertilizer should be applied only if plants show signs of nutrient deficiency or if your soil test indicates that there is low nutrients in the soil. If you over fertilize, you will make your plants more susceptible to pests and diseases. And you also don't want your fertilizer ending up in the water body because as I mentioned before, when your fertilizer ends up in the water body, you are actually fertilizing algae, who wants to do that? When you have algae, algae populations blooming, then you have issues with fish gills, etc. Because, because they want to minimize nutrient runoff during rain events, for most areas in Florida, there is a fertilizer blackout period where fertilizers are restricted between June 1st to September 30th. You can't apply nitrogen or phosphorus. You may be able to apply iron, but wherever you are, just make sure you know what the fertilizer rules are. Okay, so cost-efficient landscaping, you want to fertilize appropriately, so you're not wasting money on applying fertilizer when a plant doesn't need it or you're not wasting money by applying fertilizer and then it runs off into the pond. Um, you want to make sure you're using slow release fertilizer because it releases nutrients at a rate that the plants can pick it up. It releases fertilizer um, slowly. It's not water soluble um, immediately. And so if it rains after you put on slow release fertilizer, it, all your fertilizer is not gonna end up in the aquifer. The researchers recommend that if you have palms growing in the middle of a lawn or next to turf, you want to fertilize that turf with palm fertilizer because turf fertilizer is high in nitrogen to make the turf green, but high nitrogen amounts can trigger nutrient deficiencies in palms. And so that's why they recommend that you fertilize any turf that's adjacent to palms with fertilize, with palm fertilizer. And you'll see on the bag here, this formulation is A212. So the nitrogen is actually lower than the potassium in a palm fertilizer. But that won't be the case in a turf fertilizer. Okay, so for cost efficient landscaping, you wanna reduce stormwater runoff. And if you don't reduce stormwater runoff, by using buffers around water bodies or buffers near to the drain, what happens is that you end up with pollutants in the water. And if you have a retention pond, it means that you're gonna to have to spend more money controlling weeds in the pond or controlling algae in the pond. And so this is how you save yourself 
money by making sure that you reduce stormwater runoff. All right, protecting your waterfront, use shoreline plants. I know this can get controversial because people who have um, property that's bordering a, a retention pond want to see the water, you know, you want to stand in the other night and be able to see the water and see the birds and the, the ducks, etc. But you can use low growing plants around the shoreline as a buffer. But you do want to use buffers because the buffers absorb the nutrients that are running off your landscape. And they act as a kind of like sponge to pull up any nutrients that might end up in your pond. And so, you know, if you think the view of a pond is great, you are right. But a view of a green pond that's full of algae is not great. And so you can actually use low growing buffer plants on the shoreline to filter nutrient runoff so your pond stays beautiful. Okay, so we're going to pause right here for another poll question. So type in the chat the answer to this question, true or false. Fertilizing can contribute to plant pests and diseases. I'm going to give you a few seconds to answer that. Okay, so let's go. And I'll tell, tell you the answers to all of these questions um, at the end, keep you in suspense a little bit. Okay, so let's continue. Another cost efficient landscaping solution is, your, is integrated pest management. Integrated pest management is called integrated. You'll see my, my arrow here because you're combining more than one type of pest management. You're combining mechanical control, cultural control, biological control, and chemical control to suppress weeds, insects, and diseases. Cultural control here means how you take care of the plant. So um, are you overwatering, underwatering, over fertilizing, under fertilizing? The things you do to take care of the plant can help you to manage pests or can help you to promote pests. And so integrated pest management looks at a combination of all of these strategies. An over-reliance on chemical methods will reduce the population of your beneficial insects. I mentioned that at the beginning. And it can also create what we call pesticide resistance to weeds, insects, and pathogens. So you can have fungicidal resistance. And if you have a disease that's resistant to fungicide, you're in big trouble. There is, um, you know, researchers have found that there is development of pesticide resistant chinch bugs. Once you have insects that are resistant to your pesticides, you're in trouble. There are also some weeds that have become resistant to herbicides and once you have an, a weed that's resistant to herbicide, you're in big trouble. So you don't want to use an over-reliance chemical methods. You want to use a combination of all of these so that you don't have these pests developing resistance. Okay. So in a integrated pest management, you'll hear it shortened to IPM. First, you want to look at what is your level of acceptance. Can you accept one chewed leaf? Yes, you probably can. So do you need to break out your sprayer because there's one leaf chewed up? No, you don't. 
if you have a hundred chewed up leaves, then you might be like, okay, what do I need to do? I need to get some kind of um, control, whether it's mechanical, biological, chemical, or cultural control. Why do I have a hundred chewed up leaves? Was I pruning the plant? Oh, then now it's stressed and caterpillars are all attracted to the plant. So you have to look at those issues. Preventative treatments um, are only effective for weeds and diseases. So you can't have a preventative insect treatment. So you can't spray and say, I'm preventing chinch bugs from coming. Because insects lay eggs and unless the insecticide is what we call an ovicide that will actually kill the eggs, you can only treat these insects when they're in their larval stage. So you can't prevent them from occurring. You have to treat them as they occur. But weeds, you can use a preventative herbicide called a pre-emergent, which will prevent weed seeds from growing. And fungicides, when you spray a plant, you're actually preventing the fungus from um, taking hold of the plant. So whenever pesticides are applied, they must be done in compliance with the pesticide label. We say the pesticide label is a law because when a, a pesticide is licensed with the EPA, the law says you must apply the pesticide the way the label says apply. It must be applied below 80 degrees or it must be applied um, when the wind is low or it must be applied using certain protective equipment. Um, some pesticides that are non-selective will harm all insects, including your pollinators, including your wasps, including your bees, including your butterflies. And so you want to make sure that you pay particular attention when you're using pesticides which are non-selective. These are pesticides that will kill everything. Another um, factor in cost efficient landscaping is you want to make sure that you are providing for your pollinators, that you're preserving the habitat of pollinators by using chemicals that are um, friendly to pollinators. So you don't want to use chemicals which will destroy your beneficial insects. You don't want to use chemicals that will destroy your pollinators because if your pollinator, if our pollinators die, we die too because we have no food. We rely on our pollinators for food. Okay. So the other thing is when you destroy your beneficial insects, you increase your reliance on chemical controls, which increases the potential for the pests that you're trying to treat to become resistant. When you add native plants to the landscape, you are actually providing for native wildlife habitat, whether it's native birds, whether it's native butterflies, um, whether it's bees. And so you wanna take into consideration when you're designing your landscape that you wanna include some native plants as well. Okay, so we talked about mowing height. If you mow too low, you are a part of your landscape problem. And so you wanna mow a high in order to become part of your landscape solution. When you increase turf mowing heights, it improves turf health because it promotes a good deep root system, which is healthier, which is drought tolerant and which is less susceptible to change bugs and root rot, okay? So remember I said I tease plant researchers because they watch Tur um, plants go for a living. This came from our turf researchers where they showed that when you mow your turf really low, the root system is a mirror reflection of what's going on above ground. So low mow turf has short roots, high mow turf has long roots. When you have long roots, it means that you are more drought tolerant and that you're less susceptible to any fungal diseases that would destroy your roots or any pests that feed on your roots. So you wanna mow as high as possible, okay? Again, another study from our turf researchers that showed that when you scalp, as in when you remove a lot of the turf tissue, 
So when 90% of their tissue is removed, all the roots stop growing for 17 days. When 70% of the turf was removed, 50% of the roots stopped growing. And when 50% of the turf was removed, no roots stopped growing. So you want to mow as high as possible to improve the health, the root health of your turf. Okay. So I talked to you about over pruning. This is what happens when you over prune. In that you pruned and pruned and pruned, stress the plant out, the plant became susceptible to a disease and now it doesn't look happy, it doesn't look good. So you really want to try to minimize how often you prune. I know sometimes it's difficult because you have a landscape contract and the landscape contract says, hedges must be pruned twice a month. But sometimes the hedge doesn't need to be pruned, especially if it hasn't been raining, the hedge is not on irrigation. Sometimes the hedge does not need to be pruned. And to prune because you say, the contract says prune twice a month, you're just stressing the plant out and you might end up having to spend way more money replacing the entire hedge than if you told the landscaper just prune once a month. You also want to use sanitized pruning equipment because every plant you cut, if plant A has a disease and you cut plant A and then you move to cut plant B, you're moving the disease from plant A to plant B. And then once it, the entire hedge has a disease, you have to, you know, dip into your replacement costs. Okay, so question four, um, I believe this is the last question. True or false, and as I said, I'm gonna give you answers to the question that we go to the track. True or false, integrated pest management reduces the over-reliance on chemical controls. Um, type your answer into the chat box while I look through to see what questions there are. So I'm going to give you a few seconds to do that. So I know there are some questions in the chat box I see about high pH soil and oak trees. I will definitely get to them, I promise. Um, but we're gonna go through this session and um, you know we'll address all your questions. So I promise I'm not ignoring you. Um, what I would like to do is um, get through the next section and then, you know, so if people need to go, they can. So the answer to this question is that is true. Integrated pest management reduces the over-reliance on chemical controls. Okay. All right, so let's go on. So we're gonna look at, we're gonna wrap this up by looking at common HOA concerns. Um, and this is just feedback we've gotten from persons either working with their HOA board or on the HOA board. Um, and so some concerns include more transparent guidelines for improving landscapes. Um, concerns that there are limited, that there is limited empowerment for those who don't make the decisions. And so one of the goals of this whole presentation is to give you more information so you can make more informed decisions. 
Other kind of concerns include qualifications and continued education for persons who make decisions um, for HOAs, so make it, making it based on research. And other concerns include how to integrate HOA restrictions, governance, and state regulations with, say, your Florida friendly landscaping regulation. Okay. Um, I thought I fixed my mouse issue. For more resources on this, we have um, research fact sheets available. You just type on the internet search UF, you'll see my arrow here, UF IFAS guidelines for community associations. If you type those words in, it will take you to this fact sheet. We also have a, a sample contract in the sample contract. This is the language here, feel free to borrow it. That's why we made it, we made it for your benefit. This website, your Florida Friendly Landscaping Community Associations and Property Managers Kit, very helpful. It has a lot of information on it. It has sample contracts and other resources, so very helpful. Um, this is what this sample contract looks like. So it's very helpful and want to give our acknowledgments to Dr. Pat Williams and Ms. Wendy Wilbur who contributed to this presentation. And with that, we'll end it here. Thank you so much. There's my contact information. So again, enjoy the rest of your day. I'm gonna sign off now, but it was great.